measurement. So we have a big wet lab and we do lots of sequencing, particularly genomics, but other kinds of data as well, together with doing theory and, of course, the kind of bioinformatics to glue it all together. And I want to talk about some of our work that spans that range of activity. Um, so our, you know, the, the key thing today is I want to try and talk about how we're trying to learn what makes cancers grow and um, what makes them evolve by having this hybrid approach of data and, and mathematical models. And so the work I'm going to talk about has been funded by lots of people, but most prominently Cancer Research UK, the Wellcome Trust, um, and also a bit from the NIH in the, in the US. So we're interested in learning the dynamics of cancer evolution, and some of the speakers this morning introduced cancer evolution. But just for the um, sake of clarity, this is what I'm talking about. So my picture of how cancers evolve is like this. So this is a schematic where I've got time on the x-axis, and I've got the size of a clone on the y-axis, and I've got some healthy cells in the body here in blue, and then cancers start to evolve, they start to form when there's some important heritable alteration that happens, this first red cross, that changes the phenotype of a, the cancer cell and enables it to grow more than it should in a healthy tissue, and that's a clonal expansion. But that first expansion is almost certainly a benign lesion. I notice as I get older, I get more and more moles <laughs> on my body, and they're clonal expansions, but they're benign. So there's some additional evolution that happens within that first lesion, and that's the acquisition of these further heritable alterations which can transform that initial benign lesion into an invasive cancer that's capable, say, of spreading around the body or evading treatments. So these, um, these red crosses are of fundamental importance. These are the alterations which drive um, cancer evolution. So they may be mutations or they may be other kinds of heritable changes like epigenetic changes. And one of the very kind of fundamental questions is, what are those um, alterations? And that's what I want to focus on mainly today. But some of the other questions that we've been interested in and I'll talk very briefly about are, can we learn about the dynamics of this process in general from the data? So some of the dynamics that we're interested in are, well, what's the mutation rate, both of just background passenger alterations, but also how often do these important alterations show up on average? Um, and then particularly we focused on what's the consequence of, these, um, of these, these driver alterations? How do they change the fitness of the cancer cells? How much more um, do they make the cells with the alteration grow than the cells without that alteration? So we've been very interested in trying to quantify selection in cancer. Okay, but fundamentally, we're interested in the red crosses. In other words, we want to know which mutations in the cancer genome are Ryan Gosling. I'm sorry, this is a terrible joke, and I've used it too many times, but um, apologies. Um, we want to know which mutations are Ryan Gosling. Um, so as you all know, the state of the art is um, doing statistical genetics on big cohorts of cancer data. So one of the very best examples of doing this is the Intergen pipeline that's come from Yuria Lopez's lab in Barcelona. And what this does is take very large um, cohorts of data of, say, of a particular cancer type, so colorectal cancer or lung cancer or something like that. So all of those cases are sequenced. You pull all the data and you look for patterns in that data that are indicative of a gene being a, a driver alteration. So it's all computational analysis. And so the patterns that I look for, so here's a, here's a gene, this gray bar. Um, and what the intergen pipeline does is say, well, across this big um, cohort of sequencing data. These are all the mutations that exist in, in this gene. And then there are particular patterns of mutations in a gene which will occur if that gene is a driver, if it's important for cancer evolution. So the kinds of patterns that um, Intergen uses are to ask, well, driver genes should be enriched for mutations. They should have more mutations in than you expect by chance. And that's because you expect those mutations to be functional and make the cancer grow. So if you sample cancers, you're kind of sampling the winners of that process and they should have those mutations in. So they should have more mutations than you expect by chance. And you can quantify that in different ways. One of the popular ways of doing it is using these DNDS statistics, which compare the rate of non-synonymous, potentially functional mutations to the rate of synonymous, potentially non-functional mutations and looking for an enrichment there. So that's, that's part of it. Um, Genes, of course, are coding for proteins, and proteins have structure. And so you'd imagine that if a gene is a driver, then just changing particular parts of that protein structure 
that, that is coded for by that gene are, are what's important for the biology. So you wouldn't expect, therefore, to have mutations randomly scattered across the gene if it's a driver. You'd expect the mutations to be focused in functional hotspots of that gene. And then if you have additional functional information, you can integrate that as well, and you'd expect drivers to be enriched for functional changes, as, as makes a lot of sense. So if you do this, it, it works really well, and Intigen is fantastic. And so if you go to the website and you type in colorectal cancer, which is the cancer we study um, foremost in our lab, you get this list of genes which comes out. And we saw a plot like this earlier um, in the first talk of the day. And so here you can see, you can maybe read, there are very familiar um, cancer gene names. So this first hit is in APC, and that's in virtually all colorectal cancers. The next one is in P53, RAS. And then there's this long tail of um, other genes which are called as drivers by this analysis. So that's great. But let's just take a step back for a moment and think about what this list is. So this list is telling us that, on average, across that big cohort of data that was fed in in the first place, that these genes are the drivers. But what it's not telling us is that in a specific cancer, you know, if a patient comes before us, that this gene is a driver in that patient. It's just an average in the cohort. An average in the cohort is a driver, but not necessarily a driver in a specific patient. And so that's the problem that we've wanted to address and we've tried to address is how can you assess the driverness, if you like, the Ryan Goslingness of a mutation in an individual um, tumor, in an individual patient? Because this, this approach is very powerful, but it doesn't do that. Um, so the reason that you might want to do that is, of course, that every um, patient's evolutionary path of their cancer is very, very different. In the lab recently, we've been studying colorectal cancer patients who have metastatic disease, and we call them exceptional survivors because they have stage four disease, so they have disease spreading around their body, they have lots of chemotherapy. Typically, the outcome for um, um, people with uh, stage four bowel cancer is, is relatively short survival, but these are remarkable group of patients who have late stage disease but just, just keep going, they, they don't die and we don't know why. And so you can see this, this particular person, these are all the samples we have from this one individual, it's really unusual kind of time course to expect for metastatic cancer patients. This particular patient has the classic um, colorectal cancer mutations in their primary tumor, they have APC, KRAS, P53, and so it makes you wonder just this one kind of case study about whether or not drivers, which are on average a driver, really are a driver all the time, because there's some special biology going on here, even though the mutations look quite similar. Another reason that you might want to um, do this is because of multi-region sequencing. So there's a slightly gory slide coming next. If anyone's queasy after lunch, then just look away for a moment. So in the lab, we've been taking colorectal cancers. They're horrible, ugly things like this. And we take multiple samples, as you're familiar with, and we sequence each sample individually, and then we build phylogenetic trees, again, that you're all familiar with. And what you realize is that when you do all this sequencing, you sequence many, many genomes here, of course, then you find more stuff, because you've got more DNA sequence. So this is actually not a great example. But here's two of the um, colorectal cancers where we've done multi-region sequencing on them. And here we've annotated the mutations that are in that intergen driver gene list. And you can see that they tend to be clonal on the trees. They tend to be on the trunk but sometimes they're, they're subclonal. And so the question is, if they're subclonal, are they driving cancer evolution or are they just passengers? They feature on that intergen list, so they're candidate drivers, but are they actually drivers in these individual cases? And I would suggest to you that the more we sequence, if we have a limited budget and can sequence everything, we'd find more and more potentially functional drivers. And so this problem just gets worse, ironically, as our data gets better. All right. So the harder we look, the more we find. So what are the real drivers in each case? Um, so to assess what's the real driver, of course, it would be easy if we could just create this diagram, right? If we could watch in real time and we could say, well, this mutation showed up here, and we can track over time what the fate of the cells carrying that mutation is. It would be a trivial problem. You just look for the cells which expand, the clones which expand. But the problem is, of course, that we can't measure this directly as someone explained very nicely this morning. So again, the next slide is a gory one, more gory than last time. But the problem that we face is that all we get to analyze is this, right? These are these big, ugly colon cancers. This one is about as big as my fist. 
we take it into our lab and we slice it up and we do genetics on it, we do genomics on it. But this is all we get. And you can think of this really as, as being at the end of the process where what we care about is the time that went before, but we can't directly measure the time that went before. We can only measure at the end. And so um, our approach, as we've heard others are using as well, is to do, um, do uh, statistical inference or more specifically phylogenetics and kind of lay things on top of phylogenetics. So we think about the pattern of intratumor heterogeneity that exists within a cancer because cancer is this branching evolutionary process with mutations accruing in cells as that tumor grows. So of course, there's heterogeneity that results in the tumor. We think of that pattern of heterogeneity like a secret diary that records how the cancer grew. And so, you know, much like the rings in a tree are a secret diary telling you how the tree grew, you know, the width of the ring in any year tells you how much the tree grew in that year. And you can imagine you could look at what mineral content say there is in the ring and learn something about the environment the tree was in. There's a, there's a diary here written of this tree's growth. In much the same way, there's a diary written in the genome of cancer cells that tell you um, about their evolution. But that's an idea that's super familiar to all of you, I'm sure. Um, so this is what we actually do. So we have, we have data, which might be bulk sequencing data, which is what depicted, is depicted here, or it might be multi-region sequencing data. And then we want to describe the features of that data with kind of mechanistic, very simple models that actually describe the process of um, tumor evolution. And so what we've been doing is making these stochastic branching process models, which is what's illustrated here on the left. We have models where we start with our first cell that forms the cancer. And um, that cell may have a bunch of mutations in. They're clonal in the cancer. That's these mutations denoted by this letter C in my diagram. And then at some point, if the cancer is going to grow, that first cancer cell has to divide and produce two surviving offspring. And so at a later point in time, those two cells both will produce some surviving offspring and so on and so on. And you get this, this growth of the cancer population. And then mutations are ongoing. So as cells divide, they'll get new mutations. And those are, of course, heritable because they're in the DNA. Um, and that will cause um, tumor heterogeneity. So these mutations are recording the dynamics, the clonal dynamics. If we want to know, well, what was the fate of um, this uh, cell with this mutation, it just is sufficient to go to the endpoint in time and ask, well, what's the frequency of that mutation at the endpoint in time? And so we can look at what pattern, uh, more generally, we can look at what pattern of tumor heterogeneity is produced in our model given a set of parameters that describe the um, evolutionary dynamics of that cancer and then ask, is that pattern of heterogeneity that we predict from our model what we actually observe in the data? And then if it does match, we can say, well, you know, that model's probably right. And if it doesn't match, we throw that model in the bin and look for a different model instead. And so in that way, we can try and learn the dynamics of um, cancer evolution. And so we should um, think then about drivers. So if there is selection acting in the tumor, if, if one of those candidate mutations that might be a driver shows up, then it's going to make the cells that carry that alteration grow more than other cells in the tumor. And so if there is actually a driver mutation acting in this tumor, that will pattern this tumor heterogeneity in a particular way. And so we can use these models as a kind of functional test to probe individual cancers to look at the consequence of evolution to see if mutations have an evolutionary consequence. All right, I'll just talk very briefly about the data. Um, in case it's not familiar to you, um, otherwise the rest of the talk's a bit painful. So what you're seeing here is whole genome sequencing data from a bulk sample from a, a particular cancer. So it's one cancer, it's fairly deep whole genome sequence, something like 100x. And what, it's a histogram, and what we're seeing here is the allele frequency of mutations against the uh, number of mutations at that particular allele frequency histogram. Um, you can see that this Distribution has characteristic patterns in it. So up here, we have a bunch of mutations at high frequency. Those high frequency mutations are the ones that are in the first cancer cell and are therefore in every cell in the cancer. So they're at the highest frequency in the cancer population. The spread you get is because of the sampling on the, of alleles from the tumor and also the sampling of alleles on the sequencer and you get the, um, this, this spread of allele frequencies. So these ones are not interesting for describing the evolutionary history of clones within the tumor because these mutations are in every cancer cell. So it's these mutations that are in lower allele frequencies, which are in some but not all of the cells in the tumor. 
these mutations and this part of the distribution is capturing tumor heterogeneity. And so it's this part of the distribution that's informative for learning about the evolutionary dynamics of those cells in the tumor right in front of us. And just if you're not familiar with the data, this drop off at very low frequency is not because there aren't mutations at low frequency, it's because the sequencing isn't sensitive enough to detect them. We just don't have enough reads to call those mutations. So if we spent more money and sequenced deeper, I think you would see that there keeps being more and more mutations at lower and lower frequency. So this is it. So we can generate synthetic sequencing data from our model. I'm sure you can imagine directly how you can just sample alleles from the model and then you can ask, well, if I have a particular model of cancer evolution, does it produce these patterns of allele frequencies that I can measure directly in sequencing data? And you can do inference, Bayesian inference, to ask, well, what models best represent the data in front of me? And so that's what we do. So um, we're interested, of course, then, is how does this pattern of heterogeneity look if there really is a subclonal driver alteration there, if Ryan Gosling really is in our, in our cancer? So to address what the data should look like if Ryan Gosling is there, Sorry, it's an overused joke. Then um, the first thing that we wanted to do that we did quite a few years ago now is to ask, well, what does the data look like if there is no Ryan Gosling, if the tumour is evolving neutrally? And so you can kind of think of this as like boring evolution, right? All the cells are the same. They've all got the same chance of producing surviving offspring. And so you can simulate this process and you generate data which looks like this. You can also write down analytical um, forms for what this distribution should look like. And it turns out that this tail of ever more mutations at ever lower frequency, which I think keeps going up if you remember the sampling, uh, the lack of power to call mutations at very low frequency. So this tail of ever more mutations at ever lower frequency has a power law distribution, it's one over F squared. Um, and you get this beautiful kind of mathematical um, result that comes from thinking about how the cancer is evolving that tells you what these allele frequency distributions should look like under this evolutionary scenario. Um, it's the laurier dalbrook distribution and others had found it. Um, before. So then you can ask, well, if this is kind of our null expectation, if there's no interesting evolution, if there's no driver mutation, we should see ever more mutations at ever lower frequency. What happens if there is a driver alteration? So if there is a driver, so what we're talking about is some alteration has happened in this cell, turned it red in my cartoon, and then that cell produces more surviving offspring than other cells in the tumour, so it clonally expands. And so, in other words, the progeny of this cell become overrepresented in the final tumour. And so I'm sure you can imagine what the data look like. What the data then look like is that you get this additional bump in the distribution. So you get too many mutations at high frequency compared to what you expect in the um, null, in the neutral case. And so just very specifically, these mutations here in this bump are the ones that have been acquired along this lineage prior to it getting that selected alteration. And then they're dragged to higher frequency, those passenger alterations, as that subclone expands. And so just kind of the subtlety here, which I think is obvious, but just in cases, that you see selection in the data because of the passenger mutations being overrepresented. You don't see the driver. That's a hard signal to find because it's one mutation amongst many. But you can see the consequence of that driver because it drags many hundreds or thousands of passenger mutations to higher frequency. So kind of ironically almost, it's the passenger mutations that give you the signal of the the driver in these kinds of evolutionary analyses. You can say actually very quantitative things about selection from, from these kinds of setups. So it turns out the number of mutations in this bump is proportional to the time at which the clone arose. So if the clone arises very early in tumor evolution, there hasn't been much time. You know, this branch here is very short in the phylogenetic tree, so there's not many mutations in this bump. Whereas if the clone arises late, then lots of time has elapsed, so the bump is very large. So you can time when the clone arose from the size of the bump. You can also say something about the growth rate of the clone just from the allele frequency. So very fast-growing clones will be at high frequency. Slow-growing clones will be at lower frequency. Um, so you can start to get quite quantitative measures of um, the clonal dynamics just from these snapshot data, which is something that I really, really like. So... <coughs> So now we've got an expectation of what the data should look like. If there is a driver alteration there, we should see a pattern like this. Whereas if there isn't a driver alteration, it should look a bit like this. There's a question at the back. So question, uh, what, what does this model tell you to do to say upper back expression? And then your background mutation process might be affected by this. Is that what you're trying to 
Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. So I've glossed over the details, obviously, but um, the, this tail, which I didn't mention, but you can see is also present in the selection case because these are the neutrally evolving mutations within the selected subclone plus the rest of the tumor. So the tail is always there. Um, the gradient of that tail is proportional to the mutation rate. So if in the case that you're talking about that, that you have apobexa or some other mutational process that changes the mutation rate, you can see it in the data because it causes the tail to bend. But it's a good point, thanks. Um, all right, so now we have a kind of expectation of how to go and look at the data from this evolutionary point of view to decide if um, the selection is acting or not. Um, just as an aside, having these evolutionary models of how cancers grow, I think is really important for um, interpreting the data for doing maybe more classical statistical genetics. As you know, there are a bunch of tools out there to infer subclones in cancers, and they work on this assumption that mutations that are at the same frequency in bulk sequencing or in the same cells. But unfortunately, that assumption is wrong if the cancer is evolving neutrally because the frequency that you find a mutation at is just proportional to the time which it um, occurred. It doesn't necessarily mean it's in the same cells. And so if you, this is simulated data where it's neutrally evolving cancer, there's no like dif differentially selected subclones here. And if we run one of those clustering tools on the data, some work that Julio did, you start to split this neutral tail into, um, into different um, subclones which are false. So you get a false signal because you've got the wrong generative model, if you like, in that statistical deconvolution of the, of the data. And so you can correct for this. Once you know what the data should look like and because the tumor is evolving, you can um, pull this apart. And Julio has made a brilliant tool which is called Mobster, which corrects for this kind of neutral tail phenomenon in the data and gives you a more accurate subclonal reconstruction. And you can download that and use it if you're interested. Okay, so that's fine. So we've got expectations about what the data should look like if there's selection, but they're all under this assumption of well-mixedness, and that assumption is not very good because tumors have spatial structure. A few years ago, we developed with a company an assay to measure in space to effectively stain for uh, mutations. So these are sections of colorectal cancer, th thin slices of colorectal cancer. And we've got this, this assay called Basecoat, which stains for um, particular point mutations by looking, doing RNA hybridization. And what you can see here, the pale region is cells in the tumor, but they're probably stromal cells. The yellow region is regions of cancer cells which don't carry that mutation. And the red regions are cancer cells which do carry that mutation marked at the top. And you can see you get these quite beautiful images as exquisite spatial structure in the tumors. And this spatial structure really messes up that nice maths I showed you before it breaks these results. So we need a method if we're really going to look for driver alterations that can handle spatial structure. So that's what we've been working on more recently. So we can just take really the exact same framework, these stochastic branching process models, and we can put them in space. So here you see them in 2D, but of course you can also do it in 3D. And so you can grow a tumor and cells have rules about pushing other cells out of the way and about how they migrate, like how fast they diffuse. Um, and then you keep having mutations accruing in these spatial processes. And you can ask then, well, what does the data look like if you introduce a uh, selected subclone on an otherwise neutral background? So what you're seeing on the left here is simulations where the tumor is strictly neutral, and on the right where there's subclonal selection. At the top, you're seeing the clone identity, the blue and the red, and on the bottom, you're seeing a lineage identity. So it's just a color map from the space of mutation. So you can start to see how different neutral lineages are dispersed in the tumors. And you can see from these, just from these colors that you get characteristic patterns if there's selection. This whole selected subclone is one lineage. It doesn't get split in my color map because all those cells have a recent common ancestor because it's rapidly growing. So you can see in space, the pattern of genetics in space also gives you a readout of selection. And so to, um, you can also see this in phylogenetic trees. So this is how people typically um, represent multi-region sequencing data. So we can take our tumors, we can mimic the process in simulation of taking multiple samples from these tumors. They're those black circles that have just appeared. And then you can simulate sequencing data and you can reconstruct phylogenetic trees from the simulations. So what you're seeing here is on the left is um, neutral trees corresponding to this neutral simulation and on the right, two selection trees corresponding to this type of simulation. And in each half, you've got two different trees. You've got trees with only 10 samples, which might correspond to kind of taking a punch biopsy from the cancer. 
but on the right you've got trees with 400 samples which might correspond to single cell sequencing. Um, and then I can see already, you know, you look at the trees and you can see that the trees have different structures when they're selection or when they're neutral. And so when there's selection, you get a long branch, which tends to be the mutations that have arisen in that subclone. That's that bump in the earlier um, allele frequency distribution. So you get these kinds of sticky out branches here. Also, if you sample uniformly, the selected clade is much more um, bushy because you get over-representation of the um, ancestors in that clade. So you can then also see selection in much the same way you can see it in the allele frequency distributions. You can see selection in phylogenetic trees directly. Um, and because you can take lots of samples, you can account for the messiness of spatial structure by taking lots of samples. And so you can get a robust way to be able to call selection by analyzing tree shape, given that you've sampled sufficiently from the tumor in the first place. So now we have a sense of what our data should look like if there really is a driver alteration there now. So now we were ready, we've done the theory to go after and find out if, if Ryan Gosling's there. I'm not going to mention his name anymore, maybe once more. Um, so first of all, we needed some data. So in a big study that Andrea um, Sotoriva, my close colleague who's now in Milan, and I have done for many years, um, which is called EPIC, which stands for Evolutionary Predictions in Colorectal Cancer, we generated a big set of spatially resolved genetic data. So the next slide is minorly gory if anyone is worried. Um, what we did is take colorectal cancers, we took four large samples, kind of around the clock of each colorectal cancer, and then with each of those larger samples, we split them into many tiny samples. So colorectal cancers are made up of these structures called crypts, which exist in the healthy colon. You can think of them as a test tube, and at the base of the test tube are a small number of long-lived stem cells, at least in healthy colon, that produce progeny that repopulate the rest of the crypt. And so you can think of, therefore, of each crypt as being a clone, and what we did is pull out individual crypts from the cancers. You can see them here, and we sequenced each crypt one by one. So you can think of it as clone by clone sequencing. But because each crypt has about 10,000 cells, you have enough material there to do really high quality multiomics on each individual clone. So that's what we did. So we took lots of crypts from each of the samples from each of the regions of each tumor. And then we did full transcript RNA sequencing. We did attack sequencing to measure chromatin accessibility. And we also did deep whole genome sequencing to about 50x on each crypt, as well as a whole bunch of low coverage sequencing that we heard about earlier. So we generate this enormous set of data with something like 1,400 samples with reasonably good overlap between the different omics from about 30 colorectal cancers. There's also some precursor precancers in there, which are called adenomas. Um, the data is all available online to download if anyone wants to play with it. Um, so the first thing we did is take just the genome sequencing part of that data and we built the phylogenetic trees. Here's our, our forest of phylogenetic trees from the EPIC cohort. And so some of you are like eyeballing the trees, right, looking for selection. I think this one looks pretty good. This one's got a sticky out long branch. You'd imagine this subclone is under selection here. I don't know if there are any other obvious ones. So I think the first conclusion I would take away is that there isn't very often very strong signs of subclonal selection in colorectal cancer from these, these kinds of statistics. Um, you can argue about some of the other ones. Um, so eyeballing it is not very good. And so we wanted to be able to do something a bit more quantitative. And so what we did is um, try and match our spatial simulations to the data using Bayesian inference in the way that I described before. So what we do is we grow spatial tumors. Um, we mimic the process of spatial sampling to kind of mimic where we got samples from in the actual tumor because we took photos of the tumors when we sampled them. And then from our simulated tumors, we can construct a phylogenetic tree and we can use Bayesian inference. We use approximate Bayesian computation to match the simulated tumor trees to the actual observed tumor trees. We do that by making statistics over the pairwise distribution of um, coalescence times on the tree. Um, and then that's sufficient for doing good ABC. You can show that in simulation and you can do parameter estimation. Um, you know, you can do get posterior distributions for the input parameters in the model. So the things we really care about are, is there evidence of subclonal selection? And then we care about the time of the subclone, how fast it's growing and what the mutation rate is. And you can get good posterior distributions from all of those things. It, it works quite well. The code for doing this is also available if anyone wants to play with it. Sorry, these, these leaves can be perceived as single cells, right? 
single clones, yeah. So they're, they're definitely not single cells, but they clones. clones. Yeah, so they're, they're cell, a group of cells with a recent common ancestor. But they're relatively homogeneous. Yes. That's yeah. At least to the resolution of the data. Yeah. Um, okay, so when you do this, um, and you can ask, well, how often do the phylogenetic trees look like um, selection or look neutral? What you find is that in about half the cases, we're really damn confident that there is no selection shaping that phylogenetic tree. Only in a small um, number of cases, these um, orange here, there's six cases out of 26 where we had good enough data to do this. We're really confident there is selection, and in roughly a third, we're not quite sure. The inference isn't conclusive one way or the other. So the summary would be that strong subclonal selection presence of these drivers in colorectal cancer is, tends to be a, a, a rare event. You can verify this with, with DNDS. If you look at the mutations which are subclonal in candidate driver genes in the selected um, cases averaging across those versus the neutral cases averaging across those, then DNDS in the selected cases for mince missense and for truncating mutations is greater than one. So you get this orthogonal integer-like method verification that this is working well. Um, all right, so of course this inference works on a tumor by tumor basis. So once we've done this, then we can go back to those phylogenetic trees on a case by case basis, and we can evaluate whether or not those subclonal driver alterations in those cancers really are having an evolutionary consequence or not. Do they really pattern the trees or not? And so this is the one that I pointed out in that initial forest of trees. It's got this sticky out clade here of lots of closely related samples. I should say here the colors represent the spatial regions in the tumor. So you can see that this clade here is representing samples as a clone which spans this A region and this B region. So it's an enormous clone across this tumor. And that clone carries a, a putative driver alteration in KRAS. So in this case, you'd be pretty sure that that KRAS mutation really is functioning as a driver. But then there's some of the other cases. So this is an interesting one. There's a PI3 kinase mutation here. It's in a hotspot thought to be functional. But here the inference doesn't say there's likely to be selection. And so this is potentially a passenger alteration despite being a driver in other cancers. And then in this cancer, there's lots of mutations in interesting genes and the inference calls them neutral. And so I, I just, you know, I think it's obvious to everyone, but this doesn't definitively tell you if the mutation is neutral or not. But given the data, you know, given your power to call it, it says that it's neutral. So a way that you can interpret that is these mutations are not having a strong enough effect to pattern the data. So they could still be drivers. That's the, my caveat, my get out of jail card. But they're not super strong drivers given the power we have to see this stuff in the data. So the final um, Ryan Gosling reference comes here. So if we ask how often is Ryan Gosling um, really in our cancer when we could see a subclonal selection event, well, there are six cancers where there's a Ryan Gosling there, and four of those six cancers, we have a mutation in a driver gene. And so four of six cases where the subclonal selection are marked by a mutation that we would think should be a driver. And so then if you think about what that means for the integer list in terms of sensitivity specificity, we can think of this as a measure of sensitivity of the integer list. And that gives us a sensitivity of about two-thirds. And so the, what that means is there are more drivers to be found, that the genomic hunt for drivers is not over, or there's drivers that act through non-genetic um, mutation mechanisms. So then if we consider the flip side, so how often was a cancer evaluated as neutral by the inference and actually contained a putative subclinal driver alteration? So there was someone masquerading... Um, so this is a picture of Harry Kane, who does look a little bit like Ryan Gosling. So someone masquerading as <laughs> Harry Kane. Um, it's 11 of the 15 cases have a predicted driver alteration where the inference calls those cancers neutral. And so you can think of that as the specificity of the driver list as only being about a third. So this problem of calling drivers on average and they're not really being drivers in individual cases looks to be a big problem, um, at least given the resolution of the data. All right, so the data, as I said, highlight and the inference highlights that there are potentially other sources of driver alterations in cancers. So one that we think is a potential source is changing the chromatin structure. Um, I think there's potential that these epigenetic events are directly drivers. So we have this spatially resolved epigenetic data in our, in our cancers. 
And what you're seeing here is one particular cancer. We're looking at attack sequencing traces. So when the, you get more reads, when the density of these lines goes up, um, that means the chromatin is open at that location. You're looking at, so chromatin accessibility of the promoter of JAK3, a putative oncogene. Um, each line here corresponds to a different region of the cancer, and the orange line is the adjacent normal tissue that we also attack sequence. And what you can see is that in the healthy tissue, the promoter is closed for this gene, but it's open clonally within the cancer. Every region in the cancer has open attack sequencing data here. So, you know, this is by no means um, causative evidence, but it's suggestive evidence that you could get changes in accessibility to activate oncogenes. So if we look across um, all the tumours at once and we ask how often do we see recurrent changes in chromatin accessibility of promoters on the left, enhancers on the right, each row here is a gene, each column is a different cancer, and the colour tells you whether or not that change in accessibility was found clonally as a gain or clonally as a loss or subclonally as a gain, subclonally as a loss. You can see there are a bunch of alterations in genes which occur of the chromatin structure occur recurrently across different cancer types. And often they're in putative cancer driver genes. There's some stats in here and FGFR3s and things like that. And they, these changes in chromatin accessibility occur even when there isn't a mutation in the gene. So, and they look to be clonal, so they look like they're inherited in the cancer. So it may well be that just changes in the epigenetic state directly are, um, could function as driver alterations. Um, we also see if we, I mentioned we've got precancers, adenomas. If we look at the burden of these chromatin accessibility alterations, they're much higher in cancers compared to adenomas. So they look to occur at this transition to malignancy. And so we, another slightly suggested bit of evidence that they could be drivers. Um, if you look genome wide, you see changes in chromatin accessibility that are very reproducible across cancer types. If you look at the binding of transcription factor locations, this slide is totally unreadable, don't worry about it. Um, you see that transcription factor binding sites open and close in such a way that there's programs that could run which are correlated with interferon signaling, so something about immune signaling, and also with stem cell-like programs. Um, so again, it's sort of some evidence of functional consequence of these rearrangements of the chromatin architecture. So, so I think just epigenetics per se, chromatin architecture per se, could be a potential um, source of new drivers, uh, undiscovered drivers for cancer evolution. Um, and we can use our multi-omic framework with this mathematical modeling to um, try and understand what is driving um, different subclones. So in this particular case, this, this case is called as being under selection by the inference. And that's because you've got this clade here which spans multiple tumor regions. And this particular clade in the tumor has a truncating mutation in RNF43, which is a wind signaling gene. Um, so it's called a selection by the inference. And then because we've got the RNA or the attack sequence from this claim, we can say, well, what is the phenotypic consequence of that mutation? We can start to learn about the biology of these selected subclones by looking in the data. And so you can make these volcano plots where you plot the full change in gene expression of samples in the selected subclone to the other samples in the tumor. Um, so you're seeing the fold change on the x-axis against the p-value corrected on the, um, for multiple testing on the y-axis. And you can see there's a bunch of expression changes um, within this subclone, and this, they correlate with various metabolic changes. So you start to be able to use the data to understand the phenotypic consequence of mutations in vivo in patient tumors. And so in the same way, you can start then to learn about what might be candidate drivers of subclones, which we know are under selection because they come up in the inference, but we don't know what's driving them. So that's one of these cases here. Here the inference calls this as being the selected subclone because you can see that it spans samples from this whole top um, half of the tumor. So there's absolutely vast subclone, not really separated by any mutation. So that subclone is growing incredibly quickly in this case. <coughs> There's no known driver alteration in that subclone. So we can ask, well, what does the RNA in that subclone look like compared to the rest of the tumor? There's a bunch of changes again that correlate with it being this phenotype of epithelial to mesenchymal transition. It's got a mesenchymal-like phenotype by RNA, this subclone. You can also do the same kind of um, volcano plot for the attack sequencing changes, so changes in chromatin accessibility. You see a bunch of different chromatin states in this subclone compared to the rest of the tumor. I don't really know how to rank them or interpret them. Maybe you can tell me how to do that. 
but if I cherry pick one of the top hits, it's of a regulator of p53, a very important cancer gene, as you know. And so it's suggestive that <coughs> some of these chromatin changes might um, underlie the selective advantage of this, this subclone. So um, just in the last three minutes. Um, I want to talk about how you can also use this framework to look at plasticity. So plasticity has become a very hot topic in cancer evolution. We have this idea that kind of previously that um, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between genetic mutations and the phenotype of cancer cells, and it's all about mutations. But it's becoming increasingly clear that phenotypes can change and vary even on the same genetic background. Um, to study this, people usually use in vitro models where you can measure over time, right? So you can look at a cell and you can put it in a different environment and watch how that particular cell changes its phenotype. Um, that's great and really informative, but it doesn't tell you about what's going on in a patient's tumor because you can't use that approach in a patient's tumor for the reasons we discussed before. And so to be able to probe plasticity in our data, we have to think about a different definition of what plasticity is. So this classical definition, we talked about watching a cell over time is a bit like a chameleon. Like we have a cell that can change its color depending on the environment that it's in. Um, but that's not very useful for looking at our data because we can't measure over time. And so the definition that we use is to try and look at phenotypic heterogeneity, like variability, say, in gene expression within a clone. Because we can define clones really well and we can measure the RNA of different samples from within that clone. And so I like this picture of the stormtroopers. They're all the same, right, apart from this guy. He's got this red thing on his shoulder. And so he's... Um, He's phenotypically heterogeneous compared to the rest of the um, stormtroopers in that clone of stormtroopers. So this is the definition we are going to use to look at the data. Um, and so um, we have definition of clones from genome sequencing, and then we can measure phenotype by sequencing the RNA of these samples that we take um, at the end. And so we can compare to look at this relationship between the genotype and the phenotype. Um, and so specifically what we do is this, is we have our phylogenetic tree um, and we ask these bars here, it's just a cartoon, these bars represent the hypothetical expression of some gene and we ask which genes have um, expression which correlates with the genetic ancestry. And so in this case you can see that all of the cells which are red all have high gene expression of this hypothetical gene whereas in the rest of the tumour they have more variable expression. Whereas this gene here on the right has just variable expression anywhere in the tumour, nothing to do with the, with the phylogenetic history. And so in other words, you can do a regression of um, the variability in gene expression of, against um, phylogenetic history. And the way that works is you simulate a random walk in gene expression along the tree. Um, and samples which are close together in evolutionary time, so close together on the tree, should have similar gene expression, therefore, in this random walk model whereas um, the only way cells will have um, different gene expression is if they're far apart in evolutionary time. So if genes are having clonal patterns of expression, if expression is controlled by evolutionary history, you can detect them by deviations from this expectation that comes from a random walk model. And so this is a process that you may know is called phylogenetic signal analysis. There's various statistics that have been developed to do this. We used Pagel's lambda, which you know, does this regression over the tree. And so um, here's an example. So this is gene expression of here in pathways to try and make the analysis a bit more powered. I know you can't read it, but these are cancer hallmark gene expression pathways. Um, color represents the activity of the pathway. It's a classic gene expression heat map. But on the left, it's not a dendrogram. This is the phylogenetic tree, and I've just cut off the trunk. And so what you can see straight away is there are patches of um, clones here, these crypts which have very similar gene expression patterns to one another, but they are on very different genetic backgrounds. So you can see the same phenotype coming despite very different genetic ancestry. And so I think that's good evidence of plasticity. We see the same phenotype evolving independently um, or appearing independently, irrespective of the underlying genotype. <coughs> if you take a, do statistics across the whole cohort in this way, we find that um, only about 2% of expressed genes have heritable patterns of gene expression in this framework, you know, given the power of the data, which is not great. But um, 
you can take that to mean there isn't evidence of very strong heritability in gene expression for most genes. Um, and similarly, we can ask, we can do a kind of very simple EQTL-like analysis where we ask if there's a mutation in a gene, um, is it associated with a change in gene expression of the gene in cis? And we see that those associations are really quite rare in the data as well. Only about 2% of SMVs, which might sit with our expectation that most gene mutations are neutral. All right, so I'll, I'll stop there. So I've shown you, you can use mathematical models to predict what tumor sequencing data, particularly the pattern of tumor heterogeneity, should look like under different evolutionary scenarios. And you can use that expectation to evaluate whether or not a mutation is likely to really be a driver in that individual cancer, because if it was a driver, it would cause a characteristic pattern of tumor heterogeneity. In colorectal cancer, we find that subclonal selection is quite rare. And then if you have this spatially resolved multiomics and together with this mathematical framework to evaluate evolution, you can kind of put it all together and start to be able to phenotype clones and discover non-coding driver alterations using kind of evolution as the tool. So you're looking at evolutionary consequence to do the, do the discovery. And so I think it's a really um, powerful setup to have, have the two together. Um, so lots of people have done the work. Jacob did all the last thing I spoke about, about plasticity um, and phylogenetic signal. The modeling was all done by Tim and Heidi, who was a PhD student with Andrea. The EPIC work's all been a collaboration with Andrea. Some of the earlier work Julio did about, um, about uh, the allele frequency distribution stuff, and it was started by Mark Williams, who's on there somewhere, who was a PhD student with me at the time and is now a postdoc at NMSK. And I mentioned the funders al already. Um, this is our lovely lab. This is in Darwin's house, which is in southeast London. If you're ever over, do go and visit. It's a lovely day out. Um, and thank you very much. Thanks, Gerald, for the fantastic talk. We have like 10 minutes to listen to questions. Martin? Um, I, I have a couple of questions. I might, I might just, but maybe one or two just to, to start. Kind of along the app. So, so very simple on, on this viral W frequency distribution. Um, so, if I understand correctly, the, the argument is not that this, once you get this tri model or multi model distributions, this is kind of what you observe is mostly like some collateral damage that you get, you see variant allele frequency. So, so basically, this middle peak, you, you don't have the actual, the actual driver is just one of the many peaks. So, my, my first question is can you detect actually the actual driver? Yeah. So, the driver makes that peak appear, and that driver will be in the peak for exactly. sure. But can you identify the driver? So uh, you so you can't. So the peak might be made up of say ten thousand mutations across the whole genome, and the method itself doesn't give you a way of prioritizing which of those ten thousand mutations it's likely to be. Okay. But what you can do is, was the point I tried to make was that if you have a candidate driver and it's in one of those peaks, then it okay. almost it's certainly is a driver. Okay. Um, yeah, we, we, we've tried it, it becomes, yeah, no, so we, we have done it. So one of the problems is that in healthy tissue, there aren't normally clonal expansions. So if you sequence a big bit of healthy tissue, you essentially find no mutations. <laughs> and that's not because they're not there, it's because you don't have the power to detect them. And so the things that, the, say, the Sanger Institute have done with finding lots of mutations in healthy tissue is to sequence effectively individual clones or cells or tiny numbers of cells in, in healthy tissue, and then you find all the mutations because you have power to detect them. Yeah, you see the same frequency distributions, and they're a readout of the, of the clone sizes for sure. Um, so we, we've done some work reinterpreting the Sanger data from Indigo Martin Corona in esophagus, where they've done really beautiful, exquisite, spatially resolved sequencing across patches of esophagus, and there you can see clones, and you can do this kind of clone size distribution to measure the dynamics of those clones. There's a paper in eLife a few years ago. Thanks, Carol. There was a question there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you account for the effect of copy number evolution from your period table frequency? Yeah, we do. I'd glossed over all the details. So um, 
um, we don't plot variant allele frequency, we'd plot either the cancer cell fraction or uh, a kind of cheat, which is often better actually because of the challenge in inferring good copy number, especially if there's any subclonal copy number, is just to filter out the regions of the genome which are non-diploid and just look at those. Because everything is in linkage, right, in a cancer because it's clonal evolution. So you can throw parts of the genome away. And as long as you have enough mutations left in the bits you keep, you have the same signal. Yeah, so I, I had one tiny bit on it. Um, so, e yes, so you can do exactly the same as I showed with the RNA-seq data and ask what's the difference in a attack-seq signal. We call them SCARs, so somatic chromatin accessibility alterations between the clone and the selection and the rest of the tumour, and you see differences there. But the challenge I have is interpreting which are the important differences and which are the passengers. And I think part of the challenge is not having a noise model to interpret the attack seek, but also not really having a mutation model. So the whole reason the SMV analysis works so well is that we can have really simple models to describe the accumulation of SMVs and get good expectations about what the data should look like. We don't have those models for the chromatin changes, so they're harder to interpret. Yeah, so regarding the chromatin changes, I'll finish with her and then start. <laughs> Yeah. Something still might start that. Is it just a stochastic process or do you have a theory on that? I think that's a really good question and I, I don't know the answer. So one thing I didn't say but we report in the paper is that there are frequent um, mutations in chromatin modifying genes, so genetic alterations of chromatin modifiers. And if you use the NDS across the set of chromatin modifiers, you see that those mutations are under positive selection. Um, so I think that's one um, <coughs> candidate mechanism. The other one that I'm really interested in is that there's almost certainly a relationship between chromatin reorganization and genetic instability or chromosomal instability. There was a really beautiful paper from EPFL a couple of weeks ago in Nature looking at um, what happens to the chromatin after genome doubling. And there's this idea that the chromatin modifiers don't dose compensate properly and therefore you get chromatin kind of changes that occur after mm -hmm. genome doubling. Um, and so I think, yeah, somatic copy number alterations could be a driver of chromatin changes and possibly vice versa too. And I think pulling that apart will be really fascinating. So if you follow up of the non coding driver discovery, have you looked at long non coding RNA? No, we haven't explicitly. It should be in the data, um, but we haven't explicitly looked. question myself. Um, you designed Epic like many years ago, right? And uh, yeah. it's incredibly, I would say, informative, right? So with all the new technologies we have these days, like sickle cell things, would you, which one would you think that you would need next to maybe get a better angle of this kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the power of the EPIC data set is that there are multiple different data types there. So I think the most interesting analyses come by using the genome for the evolutionary history and looking at the interrelationship between that and uh, the omic. So I would don't want to pick one because I think the beauty of it was that integrating them all. But I think, you know, some of the questions earlier, your question, like just I think there's such interest and such lack of knowledge at this point in time about how the epigenome works. Like that's the thing I'm really excited to go after. Yes. I think those tools could be probably looked at simultaneously. Yeah, I, I totally agree. We, we have done that. Um, have so I, not, I didn't show you that today by any way, but in, I think luckily, luckily perhaps, I don't know, or boringly, in colorectal cancer, it's really rare to have 
a subclonal mutational process. So if there's mismatch repair, the whole cancer will be clonally mismatch repair. But I think another cancer type, say in breast, like with Apobec is a good example, yeah. that's much more, much more common. And absolutely, I mean, you can see it in the data directly. You often see it in the phylogenetic trees because you've got much longer branches. Mm -hmm. I was and thinking of taking some matrix of phylogenetic tree, but also I was wondering whether when you look at this distribution of the sequence of mutations, whether you can model yeah, so you can make the, mm. you're talking about having a mathematical model with a different mutation rate in the subclone to the rest of the tumour. Mm. So that's actually already in there, and yeah, absolutely, you can do that. Last question. Yeah, very last. Have you, uh, have you studied the um, uh, selective, selective advantage like um, in, in the phylogenetic trees that you... Uh, the magnitude of it. I'm sorry? The magnitude of it, do you mean? Yeah, I mean, like, different lineages may have different selective advantage. Yeah. Um, given that they have different genotypes, and I was wondering if you, if you observed something that could be related, uh, something in the selective advantage of the measures that could be related to the genotype itself. Yeah, so yeah. Like so I think, actually, the best data to look at that is not ours, because our data set is sort of big, but it's actually quite small in the number of cases, and especially in the number of cases where there's a subclone and selection, it's only six. Um, so the better data is some of the data we talked about right at the beginning of the questions, like from, from Sanger. So in the esophageal data set I mentioned, they, the mutation burden in this, these patches of normal esophagus is enormous, and you see the same, exact same point mutation occurring independently multiple times. And so with these kinds of analysis, you can therefore kind of build up a distribution of fitness effects and get confidence estimates on the fitness consequence of particular mutations. And they look fairly reproducible. Um, so there's some variability there, which probably explains why sometimes drivers are not a driver in a particular cancer. But, you know, the <laughs> as often as not, if that particular mutation shows up, it will have a similar consequence in that, that particular data set. And the magnitude of these things can be quite large. So in, in inferences in colorectal cancer, when you've got a subclonal selective event, it's something like 30 to 50, 